He was born the grandson of slaves, yet Howard Thurman would become one of the most celebrated religious figures of the 20th century. A spiritual mentor to Martin Luther King Jr. Whether we want it that way or not, we all tied together. And a moral anchor for the civil rights movement. Martin Luther King Jr. would quote Howard Thurman on many, many occasions. I think Howard Thurman, for many leaders in that movement, King included, played the role of pastor. In the 1930s, after an historic meeting with Mahatma Gandhi, Thurman becomes one of the early voices for nonviolent resistance for a people who over centuries experienced unimaginable violence. He helped to establish the philosophical framework of how to struggle. He saw himself as a spiritual activist because he was fundamentally a teacher. He had this combination of, of being kind and being strong, and I think that's a very rare combination. While Sunday morning was often considered the most segregated hour in the week, Thurman helped pioneer a church where people of different races and religions could worship together. He's suspicious of denomination and dogma and creed. He would never identify himself as a theologian because he thought theologians boxed God. And he was called a mystic because he believed religious experience was best explored within. Howard Thurman was actually practicing contemplative spirituality before we actually started calling it contemplative spirituality. At his heart, he was a, a nature mystic. Thurman is talking to trees. Trees. <laughs> Yet this mystic was also an outspoken critic of Christianity for its part in the nation's deep racial divides. And he countered with a shocking new work that offered a revolutionary new way of understanding the life of Jesus Christ and how it speaks directly to the oppressed and disinherited. I carry the book with me, Jesus and the Disinherited, every day. And he gives an Africanity to the interpretation of Jesus. He provided a, a spiritual perspective that was empowering. There were people encountering Thurman's work and being shaken at their core. I would have to find out what was the word that the religion of Jesus had to say to the man with his back against the wall. Major funding for this program was provided by Lilly Endowment. You will find true success and happiness if you have only one goal. There really is only one, and that is this, to fulfill the highest, most truthful expression of yourself. Theologian Howard Thurman said it best. He said, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive, and then go do that. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. The 1960s and the civil rights movement is exploding across America. A century after a civil war was fought to end slavery, deeply rooted segregation and blatant racism are still legal in many parts of the nation. Now they're being met head on. Be educated, but I am somebody. Jesse Jackson, Martin Luther King Jr., John Lewis, Otis Moss Jr., Vernon Jordan, and other civil rights leaders are convinced the moment for resistance has come. And no matter how they are treated, they are committed to nonviolence. The spirit in man is not easily vanquished. It is fragile and tough. You may fail again and again, and yet something will not let you give up. Something keeps you from accepting no as a final answer. It is this quality that makes for survival of values when the circumstances of one's life are most against decency, goodness, and right. They were given the power and the authority to respond to the realities of injustice in ways that 
could be true to their faith and in ways that um, did not require them to compromise the integrity of who they were. Many feel it is Howard Thurman, through his insights and early commitment to nonviolence, who evokes a spirit felt across the entire movement. Whether we want it that way or not, we all tied together. Every Negro in America is a little white, and every white man in America is a little Negro. The Negro needs the white man to save him from his fear, and the white man needs the Negro to save him from his guilt. We need each other. People sometimes seem to think that nonviolence was very endemic to the African-American community as a way of life, when in fact it was not. And even Thurman is very clear that nonviolence was a kind of a cultivated experience for most rank and file people, including leadership. I would agree that Howard Thurman was a saint of the movement. He gave us the basis for the march that we know why we march, the principles upon which we march, how we march, and what we do after the march. He helped to establish the philosophical framework for our, of how to struggle. You cannot let the oppressor break your spirit, then make it break your bones or your arms, but not your spirit. That's the stuff of, of Howard Thurman. Dr. King was not completely committed to nonviolence. When I say not committed, he saw it first as a tactic until he was fully converted to it as a lifestyle. And, and my father helped me with that to, to understand that early on, people saw things as a tactic. This is the best way. Dr. King then moves to this is a lifestyle. And that is a direct connection to Thurman's conversion. And here is a nonviolent revolutionary. One of the foundational works for the movement is a book by Thurman, Jesus and the Disinherited. I have been told that Dr. King carried Jesus and the Disinherited with him most of the time when he traveled. It's a book that really describes what it means to be involved in such a struggle as a spiritual matter, as a matter of faith, and not just the effort to change laws for the gaining of civil rights. He says that the African Americans didn't have any rights, just like Jesus, but they could choose to ground themselves in their own inherent dignity and worth. And if one were to choose this, it would have a lot to do with how they would deal with the question of what do you do when your back is against the wall?